Have you ever wondered, why does the Street Fighter movie look nothing like the Street Fighter game? Why is this movie, which should be about street fighting martial artists and warriors, actually about a group of army folk going up against a mad dictator hell-bent on world domination? Look at this. <laughs> it certainly doesn't feel like the obvious choice you'd make when adapting a Street Fighter movie. We're busted. Uh-huh. Street Fighter 2, the animated movie, tells the story of martial artist Ryu, who travels the world to seek out worthy challenges under the nose of the villainous M. Bison. The movie culminates in several dramatic fight scenes while Interpol officer Chun-Li joins forces with American soldier Guile to locate and destroy Bison's underground crime syndicate, Shadowloo. Bison survives the encounter, and he and Ryu go to war once again. Street Fighter 2, the animated movie, was praised upon its release and gathered even more attention in 1995 when it was released to VHS in the UK and America. Even recently, Ollie Reynolds on Nintendo Life wrote of the movie, it doesn't carry the same clout as Akira and Ghost in the Shell, but for me, it absolutely rivals them in terms of sheer quality. It successfully elevates what was already a monumentally influential video game by giving its characters meaningful backstories and awesome moments on screen. Part of the reason the movie is so beloved, certainly by fans of the video game franchise, is because it's more or less a faithful version of the characters from the series. It certainly feels more like Street Fighter than the other Street Fighter also released in 1994. You know, that Street Fighter. I'm going to kick that son of a bitch Bison's ass so hard! But maybe I'm being harsh. Guile is an American soldier, just like he is in the game. Chun-Li is a skilled martial artist and, well, there is fighting in the movie. But there's also a host of strange character traits that have nothing to do with their video game counterparts. Chun-Li is a reporter, Balrog is a cameraman, Dalsim is a scientist, T-Hawk is a soldier, DJ is a henchman, Sagat is a businessman, Ryu and Ken are street rats, E-Honda is a video editor, and Hawaiian. It's almost like many of these characters were written in a script then had the names of Street Fighter characters thrown on top of them. And that's basically what happens. But it's not the only reason 1994 Street Fighter doesn't feel like a Street Fighter movie. It was a disaster of a production with casting, location, and financial troubles, editing issues, and arguments over ratings, all exacerbated by a hard release date and a little buzzword from the toy-focused franchising world. Street Fighter was never about Capcom making a movie to promote a game, at Hasbro, wanting a movie that would sell some toys for Christmas. Welcome to Cutscene, and this is why the Street Fighter movie is nothing like Street Fighter the game. The very first meeting I had in Hollywood when I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed lad was a toy meeting. First day at work. No scripts, no movies, no cinema, no lenses. It was a toy meeting. And the word toyetic was the new word. That was Street Fighter director Steven D'Souza referring to a meeting which took place one year prior to the word toyetic being the biggest buzzword in all of Hollywood following the release of a little-known movie called... <laughs> But the origins of the movie can be traced back to Mattel in 1969, when Bernard Loomis wanted to develop a show based around Hot Wheels as a means to advertise them. So they got ABC to make a cartoon called Hot Wheels. It's not really subtle, is it? The show was criticized by the Federal Communications Commission, who saw Hot Wheels for exactly what it was, a 30-minute toy advert. And eventually they were proven right and the show was taken off the air after two seasons. Loomis left Mattel to become the president of Kenner, where he wanted to expand upon his toyetic vision he had for toys in America. In an issue of Public Opinion in December 1977, he proudly talks about coining the word when he told Steven Spielberg, Close Encounters of the Third Kind sounds like a great movie, but it doesn't sound toyetic. It's quite the hot take. In that conversation, Spielberg revealed that while Close Encounters might not be toyetic, he'd just seen a movie that was called... 
and this was great news for Loomis because he'd already purchased the toy rights. Our original planning for the merchandise was that Star Wars would be another picture. It would open and it would close. It would make for a good background for a toy line. Of course, now the picture's opened and it's never going to close. Despite not having any toys to actually sell for Christmas 1977, Kenner had huge success with Star Wars. Those original toys are still extremely collectible. In 2022, an original rocket firing Boba Fett fetched $230 six thousand dollars at auction now that's toyetic soon every studio and toy company was looking for the next big toyetic property and it was about to become easier than ever before following reagan's election in 1980 the fcc was directed to revise its rules on advertising in saturday morning cartoons this meant the toy companies didn't need a movie now they just needed a cartoon by the power of gray skulls Q, a subliminally capitalist but extremely cool era of children's television, flooding TV screens across the country as well as shelves in toy stores. It was a toyetic boom that lasted for most of the decade, until George Bush signed the Children's Television Act in 1990, restricting again what could and couldn't be presented or advertised in kids' cartoons. But how is any of this relevant to Street Fighter? Well, one property that saw a huge resurgence in the 1980s thanks to the FCC changes was Hasbro, and your friend of mine, G.I. Joe. In 1963, a Manhattan licensing agent named Stanley Weston sold a 12-inch plastic soldier toy design to Hasbro. G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe, fighting man from head to toe. Not wanting to market a doll to boys, Hasbro instead presented the world's first action figure, G.I. Joe, America's movable fighting man. Thousands of the four-character lineup were sold throughout the decade, but times changed. The Vietnam War happened, and by 1975, American soldier G.I. Joe fell out of fashion. Hasbro tried to keep it relevant, but those iterations of the brand didn't cut the mustard. And by 1978, G.I. Joe was removed from shelves. With $2.5 million in debt, Hasbro looks set to close down, until new CEO Stephen Hassenfeld, the modern-day father of G.I. Joe, stepped in. Hassenfeld essentially just produced crop loads of Mr. Potato Head for a few years to keep Hasbro alive. Hassenfeld believed that with the obscene popularity of Kenner's three and three quarter inch Star Wars toys, boys in America had moved on from playing with 12 inch action figures. So with a new president, no war to contend with and a renewed sense of patriotism, in 1982, Hasbro relaunched G.I. Joe, a real American hero. A three and three quarter inch figure with multiple points of articulation in conjunction with a comic book series by Marvel's Larry Hammer, plus, and crucially, a Saturday morning cartoon that debuted the following year. G.I. Joe sold huge, earning over $50 million in its first year. Hasbro's hubris even led them to release a G.I. Joe aircraft carrier toy that set disbelieving parents back $100. That was, and I am not joking here, seven foot long. By the end of the 80s, G.I. Joe had made over $600 million for Hasbro, but the 90s were less kind. With no new cartoon to shoulder promotion, sales dropped again. So Hasbro asked kids what they liked if it wasn't G.I. Joe, and the answer was simple. Cartoons like X-Men, movies like Jurassic Park, and video games like Street Fighter II. Capcom released Street Fighter in 1987 to moderate success, but the release of 1991 Street Fighter II The World Warrior was when things really exploded for the series. Street Fighter II expanded out the roster of characters, created a larger world, and added more gameplay with special moves and combos. It was so successful that it grossed $1.5 billion in 1993. It was certifiably Capcom's most popular game and inspired a slew of imitators and pretenders to its throne. And Hasbro's VP Kirk Pazigian took notice. G.I. Joe is a boys action brand. Is it military? Yes. Does it always have to be military? No. Bozigian knew the video games were becoming the new hot thing in America, particularly as the console war was heating up between Sega and Nintendo. When you look at what the kids were playing in the arcades, the number one game was Street Fighter 2. So we took advantage of that. Hasbro signed a deal with Capcom to release a line of Street Fighter action figures that were repurposes of old G.I. Joe characters, mostly from the Ninja 4 series. In fact, it was only Sagat, Dalsim, and E. Honda that got new molds, as their body types were too dissimilar to any 
other Joe characters, while Gull's Sonic Boom tank was created from the same mold as the Paralyzer tank from 1991. This wasn't new for G.I. Joe, who'd spent a lot of the 80s reselling the same toys to new kids. It's just, this time, they were based on a different property. But consumers didn't buy into it, calling the likenesses poor, the figures flimsy, and, in some cases, slightly embarrassing. Plus, at that point, there was no cartoon to contextualize this line of toys like Real American Hero did. There would be a cartoon eventually in 1995, but what if they could get a movie out quicker? It just so happens that Capcom were thinking the same thing. Enter film producer and child of successful toy empire himself, Edward R. Pressman. Pressman came from the family-owned business Pressman Toys, but rather than joining that himself, he instead went to go work in the movies. He worked with Mattel on Masters of the Universe and just had a Barbie movie cancelled by the toy company. But as luck would have it, a different IP landed on his desk. Capcom heads were flying over to LA for a few days and Pressman had just one shot to get a pitch that would seal him the deal. He called Steven D'Souza, screenwriter of Die Hard, Commando and 48 Hours, and asked him to put together a pitch in just a couple of days. D'Souza agreed, with the proviso that if they were successful, he would get to direct it. D'Souza was familiar with Street Fighter, having played it in the arcade with his son every weekend. Knowing the source material, D'Souza knew the obvious pitch was to make a movie that was tournament-based. After all, that's what the game's about. Except, he didn't want to. Prior to the pitch, he'd been sent a document by Capcom that detailed potential future directions for the franchise. I saw some artwork out of Capcom involving M. Bison where he was, some kind of third world dictator. I think the illustration had a missile base or something. So I said, I'm gonna go with this more James Bond direction. To D'Souza's delight, Capcom didn't want a tournament-based kung fu movie either. They wanted an action movie where the all-American hero Guile takes on ruthless dictator M. Bison in a colorful mission-based world. Not only did it match up with their potential story directions for the Street Fighter series, it would also tie nicely into the toys being made by Hasbro. All they had to do was get a film out by December 23rd, 1994. What could possibly go wrong? From the very first meetings about the Street Fighter script, the number one buzzword was, you guessed it, toyetic. From day one, people were asking me, what are the toys? So this pushes you right away to be Villainous Hideout? That's a toy. Even better, Hasbro would present toy artwork to D'Souza and it was his job to get it into the movie. It was the definition of a retrofit. This was all part of the toyetic vision for movies. The toy companies would have as much input as the producers do. Mattel tried to shut down Masters of the Universe at one point because the set designers refused to sign over the rights to their designs because they wanted to make them into toys. Toy sales were so hot for Batman that Kenner sat in creative meetings for Batman and Robin to make sure the movie looked like their next toy line. Sometimes it looks like a business masquerading as a movie. Capcom had their own ideas. D'Souza explained that he only wanted seven Street Fighter characters in his movie. Guile, Ryu, Ken, Bison, Chun-Li, and a couple of others. Because seven, argues D'Souza, is the maximum number of things people can keep in their mind at any one time. He even challenged the Capcom suits to name more than seven Star Wars characters, which he knew they wouldn't be able to do. And because of that, Capcom listened and agreed, but not for long. Every draft I would do, they would try and put in more characters. They would say, hey, there's this guy on page 11 that answers the phone. Can that be so-and-so? So I'd say fine. But then on the next pass, can the guy who answers the phone also be in this scene talking to these people? So they kept pushing and pushing and pushing to get more and more Street Fighter characters in the movie. Each new character necessitated a new script, which delays the casting process. Kami wasn't cast until D'Souza saw a picture of Kylie Minogue on the cover of a magazine while flying to Australia to scout locations for the movie. Capcom wanted Kenya Sawada to play Ryu, but his limited English got in the way, so D'Souza instead created the role of Captain Sawada for him to play in another draft. The role of Ryu was not cast until two weeks before production started, and it was only about to get worse. 
D'Souza arrived in Thailand to shoot the first block. This was a fighting movie. The source material is a fighting game. So the plan was to give the actors, most of whom were not martial artists, plenty of time to rehearse with stunt coordinator Charlie Passini by shooting the dialogue scenes first and the action sequences second. However, this was all upended when Raul Julia, cast to play M. Bison, arrived on set. Raul Julia had just had surgery for stomach cancer. He was like half the size he was in Adam's family. He was unrecognizable from four feet away. He looked ghastly. The first I heard was from our wardrobe people in Thailand. She says he was tremendously underweight, so we'll have to fill his costume out. But he passed his physical, and as a result, I had to throw the schedule into complete chaos. Julia's health was an unfortunate circumstance, but with the casting of Jean-Claude Van Damme as Guile, Capcom's number one choice to play the character, came a whole new set of problems. Every day, I'd ask if Raul Julia had taken his meds and if Van Damme was off them. Van Damme has been very public in the last decade about his cocaine addiction, which was rampant during the shooting of Street Fighter, reportedly spending $10,000 a day on cocaine. He would often have his wranglers show up on set to announce that he would be late for filming. So D'Souza had to create new scenes for the other actors to do so as to not waste time. And sometimes, those had to be action sequences. I mean, they had to film something. By the time they arrived in Australia for the second block of filming, Street Fighter was almost three weeks behind schedule. D'Souza requested for 10 days to make up for the lost time, but the hard release date of December 23rd, which they needed to hit for the Toyetic Hasbro deal, meant his request was denied. They had to split the already chaotic schedule, with D'Souza directing one unit and Charlie Passini shooting the stunt portion with a second unit, which backfired on more than one occasion, illustrated best by this almost slapstick series of circumstances. The two unit directors were bundled into cabs and sent through terrible traffic to each other's locations, but neither of them knowing what the other was supposed to be filming. An entire day of resources was wasted shooting completely unusable rushes. And that is somehow one of the least disastrous stories from the production of Street Fighter. When they finally wrapped in Australia, there were still around 20 pages left to shoot. After several tense meetings, D'Souza was granted an extra three days to film in Vancouver to finish the film, which unbelievably included adding in more stuff at the request of Capcom. But they got it done. And with any luck, the editing process will be smoother. Street Fighter had to be a PG-13 movie. Nothing higher, nothing lower. This wasn't just a directive from Capcom or a contract agreement with Jean-Claude Van Damme, who was trying to move away from the R-rated market, but it also came from Hasbro, who wanted Street Fighter to be a family-friendly film that would fall in line with their company values. It was a deal-breaker on three accounts. But thankfully for all parties involved, D'Souza knew what action to keep and what action to cut in order to get his desired rating from the MPAA. What he couldn't account for, however, was a tragic school shooting at Wycliffe Middle School in November 1994, just one month before the film's release. In light of this, the MPAA sent back a disappointing decision. I shot a PG-30 movie, but they came back with an R, and they said it's for graphic violence, which there isn't. There's little blood, there's no suspense, and the only torture scene in the movie is comical. It was back to the cutting room, and the resubmission to the MPAA meant there was no time to add in special effects, including Hadoukens and other moves from the game, more and more compromises to the source material. They resubmitted, and it came back with a G rating. Contracts meant that wouldn't do either. With no more time to edit and revisit the action or add in special effects, D'Souza only had one option, a retrofit, much like a lot of the production to this point. He knew G-rated movies couldn't have any swearing and also knew that then by default, a PG-13 movie could. And so... Four years of ROTC for this shit. Oh. Street Fighter hit its toyetic Christmas deadline and was released on December 23rd, 1994. It didn't perform with critics or audiences, but did do okay financially. It was number one for the week and settled at around $30 million domestically. Its overseas revenue pushed it to nearly $100 million, which was three times its budget. So all in all, Street Fighter was a success. And according to D'Souza, Capcom were thrilled with the results of the movie. It wasn't such a rosy picture on the Hasbro side of things, who, again, 
we're experiencing a bad case of G.I. Joe downturn. Kirk Bozigian didn't just pen a deal with Capcom to make toys for the Street Fighter movie, he did the same with Larry Kasanoff and 1995's Mortal Kombat. Bozigian claims that, combined, those series made around $30 million for Hasbro, which was, as he put it, phenomenal, and it probably was. Problem was, Hasbro wanted G.I. Joe to make a hundred million dollars in 1994. Bozigian argues that if they'd been given another chance, they would have released a new line of Street Fighter movie figures with all new molds. The pre-production images that Hasbro released to the 1995 Toy Fair catalogue show Garland and Bison figures that look more like Van Damme and Raul Julia. A Ryu figure was made for the 1994 release with a new mold to make it look like Byron Mann, but it never made it to retail. Capcom may have been happy with the Street Fighter movie, but it did not translate into sales for Hasbro. Their attempts to capture the Jurassic Park market with Dino Hunters and their X-Men clone X-Soldier was cancelled before it hit shelves. Kirk Bozigian's G.I. Joe department was closed in 1994, and the brand was dead for a second time. Disappointingly, on the 30th anniversary of the character's launch. What a terrible birthday. Is Street Fighter a bad movie because it was a commercial first and movie second, or is it a bad movie because of a rushed production that couldn't have gone any more wrong if it had tried? Or is it a bad movie because it's a business masquerading as a film? Or is it a combination of everything? D'Souza was a fan of the series. He recounts stories of spending weekends with his son cycling up to the local arcades to play the game. And he had a clear vision for his movie and I think he somewhat succeeds in making a comedic action movie that is fun for all the family. But it was a vision that was tainted by requests from a video game company that didn't know which direction they were heading, and a toy company desperate to sell action figures to help raise a sinking ship. But at the end of the day, this is the Street Fighter movie that we got. For all of its flaws, it does exist. And what's remarkable is that it's not really the first live action Street Fighter movie. I think more people are starting to like it now and see it as the first G.I. Joe movie. Capcom said it up front. They wanted it to be baby's first action movie. Huh, maybe it is time for that Mr. Potato Head spin-off movie. I should really call Hasbro. Nah, I'm just gonna play Street Fighter.